Hey everybody, it's Friday, May 1st, hard to believe, and it is The Doctor is In, live with TOA. Thanks for joining in with our weekly Facebook Live educational episodes. I hope they've been interesting to you. I hope they've been helpful and educational. Uh, I'm Gray Stallman, I'm your host. I'm one of the surgeons here with uh, Tennessee Orthopedic Alliance here in Nashville. And uh, I hope everybody's healthy and well and managing with this crazy stuff we're dealing with. Uh, it's interesting at least, uh, scary, uh, but uh, we're all going to get through this together. So just remember that. Um, we've been doing uh, The Doctors In Live with TOA for about six months, hard to believe. Uh, we put out a request uh, this week uh, for people to chime in and, and give us some information about what they'd like to hear about. And I picked the topic today from one of those requests. We're going to talk about rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, in addition to um, rheumatoid arthritis, we'll talk a little bit about arthritis in general. But uh, uh, it's such a common problem that affects a lot of our patients. I wanted to give you some information about it. So before we get started, I'd like to remind everybody that while I am an orthopedic surgeon, I'm not your orthopedic surgeon, and therefore all the information we're gonna talk about today should be considered for educational and entertainment purposes only. This is not medical advice. This is not a medical school lecture on rheumatoid arthritis. So if you have problems with rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, musculoskeletal system, talk to your primary doctor, talk to your rheumatologist, or talk to one of the doctors here at TOA. TOA.com is the website. You can find out about our practice, our specialties, our locations. Uh, you can actually uh, request an uh, appointment. Uh, you can even request a telemedicine appointment. We've been doing a lot of telemedicine or virtual appointments online during this period of time when people have been either quarantined at home, unable to get to the doctor's office, or concerned about going out. It's actually worked out very well for a lot of our patients, so think about that as well. Anyway, so arthritis. Everybody hears about arthritis. Everybody just assumes that it's an old person's problem. Arthritis is really kind of a wastebasket term. Arthritis uh, refers to deterioration or destruction of joints. That's really all it is. It's not a specific disease. It's an actually a uh, long list of diseases that make up what is arthritis. In general terms, there are kind of two types of arthritis. The non-inflammatory arthritis, those are things like osteoarthritis, which is the result of aging and wear and tear and breakdown of the joint surface caused by time and activity, and post-traumatic arthritis, which is basically an accelerated osteoarthritis as the result of damage or injury to a joint itself, causing it to wear out more quickly. The other type of arthritis, and this is what we're going to talk about today, is what's called inflammatory arthritis. Now there's a whole laundry list of various types of inflammatory arthritis. But in general terms, what an inflammatory arthritis is, is a destruction of joint or joints associated with large amounts of inflammation. Now inflammation is a system in your body that's used to repair or destroy uh, invaders. Uh, it can, inflammation can be very good for you in the healing process, but we've also found that inflammation is a big component of destruction of body parts. Inflammation of the heart is a big component of cardiovascular disease, for example. Well, inflammation of the joints can lead to destruction of the joints. In the topic of inflammatory arthritis, there's kind of two major uh, subcategories and then a couple of specialty categories. 
The subcategories have to do with results of blood work. Uh, there are uh, antibodies or uh, proteins that are created in your body when there is inflammation that can lead to a diagnosis of an inflammatory arthritis. So if somebody has these types of antibodies, they are considered seropositive. Sero meaning serum, positive meaning positive antibodies. There's also a non-seropositive or seronegative uh, group of, of arthritis. The seronegatives are things like psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, reactive arthritis, which is a, a type of arthritis that develops inflammation as a result of some other illness. So, for example, people who have um, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, a disorder of the intestines, have a lot of inflammation in their body and they can develop a reactive arthritis in joints. So the joints aren't the primary source, but they're responding to the inflammation in the body. People who have irritable bowel syndrome can have a reactive type of arthritis. And then the seropositive uh, arthritis are things like rheumatoid arthritis. That's the most common. Lupus, erythematosus, Sjogren's syndrome, scleroderma, and a variety of what are called vasculitis, which are all inflammatory problems of various body parts. The two special categories of arthritis, at least in my opinion, are infectious arthritis, which is basically when the joint has gotten infected, bacteria has gotten in the joint and is infecting the joint and creates a big inflammatory response related to the infection. And crystal-induced arthritis, which are things like gout. Gout is a, uh, an inflammation of the joint caused by uric acid crystals that have built up in the lining of the joint and it creates inflammation. There's also an inflammatory uh, crystal-induced arthritis called pseudogout, which kind of looks like gout, but it's actually not uric acid crystals, it's some other crystal. So we're gonna talk about rheumatoid arthritis, but you can kind of use these same guidelines when you consider the other inflammatory arthritis conditions, such as psoriatic arthritis, lupus, and that type of thing. So what is an inflammatory arthritis, particularly rheumatoid arthritis? Well, really what it is, it's a immune system problem. The immune system is what our body uses to attack outside invaders. It's the thing that protects us from infections or illnesses. It's the uh, fighting system in our bloodstream that helps keep us healthy. Well, sometimes that can turn against us. And instead of attacking outside invaders, the immune system can attack the body itself. And that's what rheumatoid arthritis is. So what's happening is your body has gone crazy. Something's happened. And the immune system starts attacking the joints. And what's in the joints are the cartilage, which is the surface of the joints, the lining tissue of the joints, which is called synovium, and the soft tissues around the joints that hold everything together, the ligaments that hold the bones together. As we develop this immune response to our joints, we get inflammation and hyperactivity of the lining tissue, the synovium, and you get synovitis, inflammation of the synovium which then produces chemicals and proteins that actually attack the cartilage in the joints and wear it down or break it down. And it can be a rather abrupt onset, although it can also occur over time, um, and it can destroy the joints. Um, the biggest features of rheumatoid arthritis and the other uh, inflammatory arthritis conditions is joint destruction in a fairly rapid rate related to inflammation, and then subsequent joint deformity related to the destruction of the bearing surface and the changes that occur in the connective tissues, the capsule, the soft tissue covering of the joint and the ligaments that hold the bones together. As far as other cause for rheumatoid arthritis or most inflammatory arthritis, we really don't know a specific cause. There are some theories uh, certainly there is, seems to be, a genetic component. There are some people 
who are genetically programmed to make it easier to develop inflammatory arthritis or develop inflammatory arthritis. There are some theories that the inflammation has been triggered by a, a, an infection of some sort, either bacterial or viral, that has revved up the immune system to fight off that outside invader. And then the immune system goes haywire and starts attacking the body internally. That's some theory. Not everyone agrees with that, but it is a real possible uh, reason why some people in certain areas develop rheumatoid arthritis. The trouble, however, is we don't have any control over those situations at this point. We certainly can't undo genetics as best as we know right now, and uh, we're not sure if it's an immune system response to an outside attacker that then turns, I'm gonna change the lights. Sorry about that. Uh, turns on itself. So, who can get rheumatoid arthritis? Well, basically anybody. Um, the pattern that we see in patients, typically it's women are more prone to getting rheumatoid arthritis than men. We typically see symptoms in the middle ages, 20 to 30 to 50 years old. Now there is a subgroup of rheumatoid arthritis that attacks children. It's called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and it can be very aggressive. As you can imagine, if you start damaging joints while they're still developing, people can have a lifetime of really bad problems. And so that in and of itself is a specialty group of patients that that uh, have this disorder. Unfortunately, uh, there's no hints to somebody who might develop it. Genetically, maybe if you've seen it in families, we know that cigarette smokers have a higher incidence of rheumatoid arthritis than non-smokers, but we don't know the relationship, so we're just not sure. Symptoms. Well, symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis are fairly classic. Rheumatoid arthritis, as compared to osteoarthritis, the wear and tear arthritis, attacks the small joints first, typically. So the hands, the shoulders, the elbows, the joints in the spine. It can also attack the larger joints like the hips and the knees and the ankles and the shoulders. But that's really more the area where osteoarthritis comes to mind in most people because those are the joints that are bearing our weight against gravity and working against the earth. And so they are more prone to wearing out. The smaller joints don't have mu as much of a work role than the larger joints do. So osteoarthritis tends to affect the larger joints and can affect the smaller joints. Rheumatoid arthritis tends to affect the smaller joints first. Typically the joints are painful, they're swollen, they can be red and warm. Most of the time, it's a symmetrical appearance. And what that means is, if you start having symptoms in the finger joints on the right hand, you'll more likely than not also have them on the left hand. So both sides are affected, not just one joint on one side. Osteoarthritis tends to affect one joint more than the other. It may be the dominant side, it may not be, it may uh, so be something that has been injured or not. Um, morning stiffness is a common problem. People really get locked up and locked down. Um, multiple joints are, are involved. It's rare that we see rheumatoid arthritis just involving the hip. That uh, Somebody with a worn out hip and all the other joints look good, that's almost always going to be osteoarthritis. There is a form of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis where few joints are affected, but that's fairly uncommon. Some of the other things that are more vague that associated with inflammatory arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis are fatigue, uh, muscle soreness, uh, poor appetite, uh, and um, commonly we'll see nodules develop around the joints. So people will get these large uh, uh, bulbous joints that stay that way uh, many times those, those nodules are, are somewhat mobile. And we can see them on the 
on the joints of the hands, the rib cage, around the shoulders, uh, etc. Um, some people actually, because it's an immune system response that's attacking the entire body, some people can have immune problems in the organ systems, the lungs, the heart, um, the skin. These are areas that uh, can also show signs of inflammation. The eyes and the uh, mucosal membranes around the mouth and the uh, uh, eyes are also an area where we can see additional findings that suggest an inflammatory arthritis. One of the things that uh, is noticeable in patients, I've talked about joint destruction, and we've got Kevin here helping me out. Um, in the latter stages of the destruction of the joints, and again, it affects the hands very commonly, we'll actually see deformity of the hands. And so if you look at his hand here, this is the thumb here. Oftentimes what we'll see is the hand kind of sweeps over like this. It's called a windswept hand, and, it, and it's related to the destruction of the joints and the stretching or the destruction of the connective tissue, and it allows the joints to uh, uh, really get deformed. And what this can do is, even if it's not very painful anymore, once the joint's completely destroyed, many times it's not very painful, but it's a very big problem with regard to function. Because if you can imagine your hands are like this, it's hard to grip and move. In addition, many times when people have end stage rheumatoid arthritis. They develop severe uh, limited motion in their shoulders, their neck, their hips, their knees, and they can become an invalid because of this. One of the most dramatic presentations that I saw when I was in medical school at Vanderbilt was a lecture where they brought in a number of patients, probably half a dozen, with some, all sorts of stages of rheumatoid arthritis. And it was amazing to me how debilitated these people were because of the skeletal deformities that this disease created, but how resolute and resilient these people were psychologically. They were very strong because they lived with pain and dysfunction much of their lives. And many of these people were very old. It was a very eye-opening experience for most of us in our class and it was one of our favorite and most memorable lectures from my recollection. Um, so, how do we diagnose rheumatoid arthritis? Well, um, there's no x-ray test that is diagnostic of it. There are x-rays of the hands and uh, the joints that can suggest it. Really, the diagnosis comes down to listening to the patient and getting a history of how, how it developed, where they have their pain problems, what their physical exam looks like, are there signs of red, hot, swollen joints, deformity, etc. And then confirmed with some blood tests. And the blood tests are looking for inflammation signs, which are kind of general. They don't, they don't specifically tell us that you have rheumatoid arthritis, they have in, you have inflammation. And then there are some antibody tests that can be used to try to narrow down the uh, diagnosis. So as I said at the beginning, um, inflammatory arthritis is a big, broad topic. Rheumatoid arthritis is just one type of inflammatory arthritis. Another one we hear a lot about simply because there's tons of advertisements on television is psoriatic arthritis. And basically that's an inflammatory arthritis, so joints are getting damaged and uh, uh, attacked, uh, in addition to large patches of psoriasis or this, uh, this inflammatory response in the skin. We've seen a lot of people with psoriasis, big patches uh, of uh, dry, crusty, angry looking uh, uh, skin rashes, and those can go together. Um, again, people can have uh, inflammatory arthritis condition called lupus, which is another form of inflammation that attacks various organ systems and can actually lead to people's death. So, symptoms, physical examination, a little bit of history, and some blood work. So what do we do to treat rheumatoid arthritis and these other disorders? Well, unfortunately, we don't have a cure. Uh, we don't have a way of reversing the damage if it's already happened. What we start off first is 
relying on the patient coming into the doctor early so we can get at it before the joints are destroyed. That's what our goal is. Once somebody presents, once we have made the diagnosis, we typically start people on an anti-inflammatory medicine, the non-steroid anti-inflammatory medicines such as ibuprofen, Aleve, or prescription medications are there to start. And those are to try to help reduce some inflammation and help control the pain. Now those medications do not change the course of the disease. They treat symptoms. Steroids are used commonly for flare-ups. Occasionally people will be on steroids uh, long term. Steroids are a different type of anti-inflammatory medicine. They are very powerful. They have significant potential risk of side effect, such as osteoporosis, skin changes, weight changes, hair loss, and that type of thing. But they are a useful tool to help try to control the inflammation. There is a category of medications that has been around a long time, which are called disease-modifying drugs, things like Plaquenil and Methotrexate. What these drugs attempt to do is help to reduce the inflammation in order to try to help reduce the joint destruction. Again, they are not curing rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory arthritis, but they can alter the course of the disease. They can make the outcome more favorable to the patient because they reduce the joint destruction. And then more recently, and a very exciting field of medicine is the biologic disease modifying medications. These are the ones that you see advertised on television all the time. Humira, Enbrel, um, Zelgans, these types of medications. And they are genetically modified proteins and chemicals that help to, again, reduce or eliminate the inflammation and therefore reduce or eliminate the joint destruction. They really act more on the immune system itself. These medications have been fantastic in substantially modifying the course of the disease. However, they also have significant potential risk because they're working on your immune system. That's the, the system in your body to help protect you from outside invaders. These types of medications can reduce the strength of your immune system and can actually make it more likely that you could develop an infection or potentially let cancer grow without being contained. Uh, that's why you may hear, for example, on the advertisements on television, if you have tuberculosis, which is a terrible bacterial disease, or you've been exposed to it, you should not start these medications because what can happen is it can knock down your immune system enough to make you susceptible to these other uh, diseases like infection. So they're great medications, they have a lot of potential, but they do have a fair amount of risk and we need to balance the benefit of comfort joint salvage with the risk of immune system compromise. Um, there is a role for physical therapy and particularly occupational therapy, therapy for the hands, to keep the joints moving, uh, bracing, uh, splinting of the joints to keep them from losing their alignment uh, can be very helpful. This is mostly in the hands, frankly, because these, these things are very important. And it's, uh, it's once you've lost the function in the hands, it may, it's very difficult to restore the function. And then lastly, there's surgery. If the joint's been destroyed, if it's very painful, such as a destroyed hip joint, shoulder joint, knee joint, ankle joint, joint replacement surgery can be done to try to help improve function and decrease pain. Um, in the hands, um, there's been a variety of artificial joints uh, made of various materials. There's been procedures to fuse the joints together so they can't move, but they are more functional because they don't just flop around. Um, there's a combination of things that can be tried. The difficulty is that, as we talked about before, that not only does inflammatory arthritis attack the joints, the cartilage, but it attacks the soft tissues around the joints. 
And so it actually loosens the joints up and makes them less stable. When we do a hip replacement, we rely on the, the elasticity of the ligaments and the joint capsule around the joint to keep it in place, this metal and uh, plastic or ceramic object, keep those in place. When somebody has rheumatoid arthritis, those tissues continue to degrade and stretch out and lose elasticity. And so down the road, instability of the joint where it now becomes too floppy, it's not held together well, can occur. And that makes it very challenging for people who have joint replacements and inflammatory arthritis to have a successful long-term joint replacement. Because even if the surface is fine, the connective tissue that holds the joints together degrades and it can become a problem of dislocation, instability, and pain related to that. So surgery, again, is not curing the problem. It's treating the results of the rheumatoid or inflammatory arthritis. In the spine, which is my area of expertise, um, there are a pair of joints everywhere there's a disc. So there's lots of discs. These white guys are the discs. There's a pair of joints in the back, and you can see they're pretty small. These little guys here are about the size of my fingernail. And as we talked about, small joints get affected first, and because small joints don't have much room to give, small joints wearing out can lead to problems of instability in the spine, of too much mobility in the spine, it can lead to destruction of the joints and pressure on the nerves. One of the more common signs of rheumatoid arthritis in the spine that's, that's scary to me is destruction of the ligaments and the joints where the skull attaches to the upper spine. With, if those joints get too stretchy, and the, uh, sorry, if the ligaments get too stretchy and the joints wear out, you can actually develop a large blob of this inflammation tissue and too much movement in the upper neck, which can lead to spinal cord compression and even paralysis. There's been some people who have stopped breathing because there's too much motion there and the spinal cord and brainstem get squeezed and those nerves stop functioning. So in my practice, we're very concerned about people who have neck pain and rheumatoid arthritis, particularly if they start showing us some signs of neurologic compression or change, because it can oftentimes be pressure at the very top of the spinal cord where the skull attaches uh, and an instability. And many times those people need surgery to stabilize the spine, again, not to cure the disease, but to prevent them from developing neurologic problems such as paralysis. So, I think that's about it. Uh, again, I told you that this couldn't be uh, a full-blown residency program in inflammatory arthritis, arthritis in general, uh, and all the issues were get related to them. But I hope this gives you some information and some insight as to what we're dealing with. Again, we talked about uh, various types of arthritis, the inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis, the non-inflammatory arthritis, such as um, uh, osteoarthritis, and uh, talked about the symptoms, we talked about the diagnosis, and we talked about some treatments. So again, if you have problems that you're concerned about, talk to your medical doctor. Sometimes the medical doctor will refer you to a specialty medical doctor called a rheumatologist. They deal with arthritis and arthritis-like conditions, and many times they'll send you to an orthopedic surgeon for reconstruction or management to help make you more functional. I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope that you guys stay safe and healthy. Please let us know if you have any questions or problems. Please let us know if you have any suggestions. I love doing these. I hope you enjoy um, listening to them. We'd love to get your input. Uh, go to toa.com if you need an appointment, if you'd like a telemedicine visit, uh, if you'd like to learn more about our practice. Uh, so have a good weekend. Go out there and live your best life.